All right, everyone, thanks for being back here on time. Next up is Dale Lane. Dale, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Ah, excellent, you can hear me. Um, hi, yes, uh, as you heard, my name is Dale. I'm a developer for IBM uh, with a background in AI and machine learning. And what I'm going to be talking today about is, uh, apart from my day job, I spend a lot of time working with schools and youth coding clubs, uh, and I spend a lot of time running hands-on classes uh, around AI and machine learning. And I've been lucky enough to work with, with thousands of, of young people and seen their reaction to, to learning uh, about what machine learning is for and what it can do and, and how it behaves. So the idea of this talk is to share a bit with you about what I've seen, um, what I've observed, you know, what kinds of things I saw the, the kids react to and, and what lessons they learned. Because actually I think some of the lessons I've seen them learn are applicable to anyone who's getting started in AI. I'm going to start with a quick level set. Mainly for those of you who probably perhaps don't have children and might not have seen this before. Uh, this, if you haven't seen it before, is Scratch. Um, it's a low-code uh, educational environment for kids, made by MIT. Kids drag these colorful blocks onto the canvas and snap them together. And this is how schools around the world teach uh, coding, introduce coding to kids. But Scratch is open source, so I've been able to extend it. So what I've done is added new blocks to that palette, new colorful uh, blocks to the, the palette that represent a whole load of different machine learning models. Uh, so what you're seeing here is ImageNet. So if you've not seen ImageNet before, it's a machine learning model that you give it an image, and it will pick out the things that it finds in that image. So that means that you know, six-year-olds can start doing kind of impressive machine learning bits like this, of recognizing what is in uh, a photo by playing with it in, in this toolkit that they're already familiar with. This is another example. This is doing face detection. So here the machine learning model is identifying where in this live image is a face. Uh, so with just a tiny little bit of scratch coding, you can do fun little things like this. Now, I could have built a whole new platform to introduce uh, AI to, to kids. But using scratch was a really inf uh, intentional choice. Because I think that sends a really clear message to students that AI and machine learning isn't something we do instead of coding. It's not replacing coding. It's, it's another tool in our tool bag. It's another thing we can use to make our coding projects better. And then if you saw the keynote from Chris this morning, he mentioned a little bit of that, that it's becoming you know, more accessible and more available to all of us. But what's even better than giving the kids an existing machine learning model to play with is getting them to make their own. So I made this uh, training tool. This, uh, it's uh, like a child-friendly training tool that kids can use to train a, a massive variety of machine learning models. Um, so for example, this is a, a project that some students did around making a chatbot. So they choose the subject uh, of what they want their chatbot to be about. Here they were doing something about the moon. So they tried to guess what kind of questions someone might ask about the moon, like how far away it is, how big it is, what it's made of, what the temperature is. And then they collected examples of how someone would ask those questions. They used those questions, those example questions they'd written, to train a machine learning model. And then they went into Scratch, and they made something like this. So here, what you've got is uh, an assistant that you ask it questions about the moon, and it uses the, the script to, to know which answer to give. And I've done variations on this. Um, but we tailor it to whatever the, the class is currently doing. So I've uh, helped classes make uh, a chatbot William Shakespeare that answers questions about his life and his plays, uh, chatbot politicians, uh, chatbot kings and queens, all sorts of stuff. But what they learned from doing this is that basic workflow of a machine learning project of uh, predicting what things you think the system's going to need to respond to, collecting examples of that thing, using those examples to train a machine learning model, and then scripting what you want the system to do in response when it sees something that it recognizes. And that workflow, although we did it in class with, with eight-year-olds, is, is kind of true, holds true for a lot of the real-world projects that I work on. Next lesson. Um, this is uh, one student's training data from making a Pac-Man project. Uh, Pac-Man, that game you know, where you're navigating around a maze. They made that game in Scratch. 
And what you're seeing here is the history of all the moves they made. So what they did is they coded this so that every time they pressed an arrow key, up, down, left, or right, the XY coordinates of the ghost and the XY coordinates for their character were captured from the Scratch game and put into one of the training buckets. So they were training it by playing the game. So the more they played, the more examples they put into these training buckets uh, to train a machine learning model uh, to be able to predict what's the best next move they could make. So what that looked like is... Uh, Too many examples. Uh, yeah, so the, they, they collected the examples as a byproduct of playing the game. By pressing the arrow keys, they were capturing coordinates and putting it into those training buckets. So then once they tr collected enough examples to train a machine learning model, they could put their machine learning model in charge of Pac-Man, take their hands off the keyboard, and watch it essentially play itself. But what they learned from doing this was when they'd only collected a few examples, and then tried it out, their Pac-Man was rubbish. It would like run straight into a wall and get stuck. So they would do a little bit more training, collect a few more examples, and it would do a bit better. It would navigate around the walls, but it would get caught really quickly. So they collected more and more examples, and it got better and better. And, and by the end of the lesson, their Pac-Man was able to evade the ghost forever, always one step ahead. So what they learned was there's this really, I mean, what I would describe as the correlation between uh, the, the quantity of training data and the accuracy of the model. I mean, I'm working with seven-year-olds. They weren't using words like that, but they still were able to spot that pattern that the more training data you have, the better your system behaves. And that, that recognition that we need more training data to make our project successful is a really key lesson to learn. And I love doing projects like Pac-Man with a class after they've done something like the chatbot one. Because there's always one, kids are honest, right? There's always one really honest kid who points out that typing in all the training examples for the chatbot example was really boring compared with playing a game. But I kind of think that's an important lesson to learn, right? That, because they're not wrong. You know, if you can collect training examples as a byproduct of something you're going to enjoy doing or something you're already doing, that's going to make a much more successful project. You know, collecting training data being the most boring, tedious, time-consuming part of a project, that's not a bad lesson for the students to learn. And it holds for a lot of the projects that I do. So um, this is a, a similar to the Pac-Man one. We were doing noughts and crosses. Same kind of idea. The kids played noughts and crosses against the computer. Every move they made, um, went into one of the training buckets. So they were training a machine learning model how to play the game. Um, and it's, I normally get the students to work independently because I like them seeing their own machine learning model that behaves in, in a different way to the students sat next to them. So they learn about how it's non-deterministic and they see that the training they've given it reflected in the behavior of that model. But with this class, um, the, the students asked if they could work together. Um, so that instead of a separate set of training buckets for each student, they had one class set of training buckets, and then all of them started playing noughts and crosses at once, and they all filled in this shared set of training data. Um, and I really liked that idea, because they collected hundreds and hundreds of examples really, really quickly. You know, 30 students can collect, 30, uh, can collect training data 30 times quicker than one on their own. Um, and actually, that's that idea of crowdsourcing as a way of effectively gathering training data, it was a really... I was really pleased that a group of seven and eight-year-olds sort of stumbled on that lesson for themselves, because um, it's a, a lesson that we all really need to learn. A few years ago, I was talking with a teacher who was doing uh, a series of lessons with their class about essentially media literacy. They were looking at how different news media sources covered the same stories, uh, which stories they sort of covered, that kind of thing. And and he was looking for a way of consolidating what he'd been learning, uh, what he'd been teaching the class. And we were thinking about whether or not a computer could learn to recognize the kind of patterns he'd been teaching the class. Uh, and could we use an AI project to consolidate what he'd been doing with them? So we gave it a try. The students chose four national newspapers. Uh, these are four national newspapers from the UK, where, where I'm from. Uh, and we collected examples of the top main front page headline from each of the newspapers across uh, several weeks. And we used these to train a machine learning model. The idea being that we'd... Uh, and we tested this model by making, again, a little thing in Scratch where you would give it a new headline that we hadn't... Well, we'd give it a headline, and we'd see which... Uh, which newspaper the machine learning model would predict that newspaper had come, that headline had come from. Initially, I just told them to test their model, and 
they were all using headlines that we'd collected and used for training because they hadn't thought about it. So I sort of stopped them and I asked them, well, do you think that's a good test? You've already told the computer that male, white, and at least blah, blah, blah comes from this particular newspaper. Is that a good test? And they sort of paused because it was obvious the fact I was asking the question that I didn't think it was. But, but I, wait, I let them sort of think about it. And I sort of said, well, look at the, the tests, that, the exams you do in school. When your teacher explains something to you, at the end of term, when you do an exam, is that question exactly the same as what you did in lesson? And they said, no, because the teacher wants to see if we've really understood it. So they'll ask us a different question, or they'll ask it to us in a different way. It's like, yes, well, that's what we want to do with computers. We need to give it different examples it hasn't seen before, because that's the only way we'll really know if it's actually learned to, to, to do this job. That idea, of, and again, how I would phrase it as separating training and test data, and the kids needed a bit of prompting on this one, but they did get that idea of it, we need to keep our training and test data apart, which again is a really important lesson for all of us. Machine learning can learn to recognize lots of different sorts of patterns, not just um, what something means. Uh, this is a project I do with really young kids. Um, two training buckets. I get them to put the nicest, kindest compliments they can think of in that one and the meanest, cruelest insults they can think of in that one. The boys enjoy doing this side. Um, I've learned some new words from doing this lesson. Um, and what they do with this is uh, I get them to, to train a machine learning model to do essentially sentiment analysis, to recognize the use of language uh, in, in compliments and insults. And then they make a character in Scratch that can respond. So if you say something nice to it, uh, it's, it looks happy. Um, I normally get the kids to draw their own faces, but I can't draw, so I've used emojis. Um, if you say something mean to it, it cries. Again, the, the boys seem to enjoy that side more than, than making it smile. But this idea of using machine learning to create systems that can respond appropriately to the user, to recognize emotions in users and uh, recognize users' use of language, um, that's a really important use of machine learning. It's increasingly becoming common, so it was a nice one for the kids to learn about. Um, it's helpful when I can find an example uh, of a, a real-world application that the students are familiar with. Um, so something like Alexa or Google Home, or Apple Siri, is something that if they haven't got it in their home, they'll have seen it before, they'll be familiar with it. So I like doing projects based on real-world uses of AI. So with this one, we were training a, a virtual assistant to recognize a command. And we two commands we identified for it, turn on a fan and turn on a lamp. They collected examples of how they would um, give each of those commands. And again, I encouraged the students to test their uh, their machine learning model. So when we got it in Scratch and we made this virtual assistant that would animate the things based on, on what you gave it, and I'd already told them, test it with new things, right? So, so they would ask it things like, please turn on the fan and it would, off it would go, please turn on the light and off it would go. Kids like to break things. And when you encourage them to try and break things, they will try and find those edge cases. Like a lot of kids I've worked with would make brilliant software testers. Um, my favorite one, I did a lesson, and one of the boys was testing this, and he uh, came up with activate the spinny thing for turn on the fan, um, which is just awesome. Um, but like I say, they find edge cases. So sometimes they would come up with a way of phrasing it that it would get wrong. So then I would ask them, well, what, what do we do now? What do you think we should do when the machine learning model makes a mistake? And you leave them to think about it, and they go, well, if we go back to those training buckets and add an example in there, then it will learn for next time, and it will get better. Brilliant. That's exactly what we do. Um, when you understand a little bit about how this tech works, that's a really obvious thing to want to do. Collect examples of mistakes that your machine learning system makes in production. Use that to improve the training so it incrementally your model gets better over time. But when Amazon does that, the media got really surprised. Like, really, really surprised. Um, a lot of the media was kind of shocked that, that they would do that. They had no idea that this is the kind of thing that's actually really common in a machine learning project. But a classroom of primary school students who have worked through a similar process for themselves understood the motivation that led to this. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that the students all thought this was OK. Uh, but. In fact, actually, a lot of the classes I've run have kind of been mixed on this. Some of them think it's okay, some think it's, some are horrified and shocked. 
And it's been fantastic because I've been able to sort of allow the class to have really interesting debates about whether or not this is okay, what kind of safeguards are needed, and what they think about this. But the point is it's a debate they can have coming from a stand starting point of understanding the motivation, understanding the tech, understanding why the companies behave like this, which is a much better place to have the debate than what I saw happening in the media. So that idea of, of collecting poorly handled inputs and crucially understanding the motivation of the big tech companies was a really good lesson for them to learn. Um, confidence scores are a really interesting thing. So I've got some of the blocks in Scratch that don't just return the answer the machine learning model has come up with, but the confidence score that it has. So if you're not familiar with this, it's this idea that in machine learning systems, you don't just get an answer, you get a score that tells you how confident the system is that it's correctly recognized your input. So I get the students to try and work with that. So this is, again, back to this idea of making a virtual Alexa. But what they've done here, and you can sort of see this over here, is if the machine learning model is less than 50% confident, it says, I don't understand, instead of just doing it anyway. Um, but how do you know 50 is the right number? I get them to experiment. I get them to play around, um, to try really high numbers, to try really low numbers. And then I ask them what they think about that and what is the right number. And it's really interesting to see how they characterize this. Because um, the idea is that if you, and I think you may have seen in the video, you can ask it things like, make me a cheese sandwich. And instead of just turning on the fan, it will say, I don't know what that means. Um, but understanding that, what that confidence score means is, if you make that number really, really high, the system will only, get, will only take an action when it's really, really confident it's understood. And it will say, I don't understand all the time. If you make that number really, really low, it will normally make its best guess, and it very rarely says, I don't understand. So you ask the kids what they think of that. The best description I've heard from a group I was working with, um, I love the way she described this. She said it was like when she was in class and the teacher asked a question, and she knew what the right answer was, but she wasn't sure, and she was too timid or too shy to, to put her hand up and answer, because she wasn't sure if she was going to be right. And that idea of, of setting the confidence score too high as making the machine learning system timid and shy, I love that as a metaphor, because it's actually a really good description of, of that behavior. Um, so we talked about you know, this idea of, well, when is it appropriate to have a really high confidence threshold? When is it, confident, when is it appropriate to have a really low uh, threshold? And what sort of systems, you know, like if it's a system your doctor is using to decide what medicine you should get, then you want that threshold to be really, really high. You know, you, the risk of a wrong answer is, is really severe. Um, but if it's something like a search engine, you just want the best the answers the system could come up with. You don't mind so much. Um, this one started out as a fun project. Um, we were doing image recognition. Uh, we, we collected a load of little Lego figures. Um, and then we were training a machine learning model to recognize which figure it is. We had like a Batman and a Superman and a Doctor Who and so on. Um, so this one you could see, it's recognized the Doctor with 99.9% uh, .9 confidence. And the students started asking me why. What, it, what is it about this picture that the machine learning model has recognized is the Doctor? Now, there are adult developers I would work with who would say there's no way of knowing. They would, they would mention the black box idea, right? You know, this idea that machine learning models are a black box. We don't know what's going on inside. We can't possibly tell uh, why the system is giving us the output that it is. But it's interesting because the students hadn't heard of this black box idea. And I, th I think what I love working with, with groups of children is they're not constrained by these kind of assumptions of what can't be done and what isn't possible. So they started reasoning it out they came up with some guesses. So they were like, you know, take that very top left corner where the background is there. Did that have much to do with the prediction? Um, probably not. Or maybe that bottom left corner? Probably not. So I encouraged them to, to take that further. I said, well, test it out. Try covering up that corner and then see what it does to the confidence. And sure enough, their theory that that top left corner probably didn't have much to do, it looks right, because the confidence barely changed. So we covered up that bit, and it still recognized it as the doctor, but the confidence dropped to 78%. So that instinct that they had that you know, that would have been more significant seemed to be borne out. So we tried it with loads of it. The weirdest bit I found, um, when they covered up his left foot, the confidence dropped to 56%. I have no idea what it is about his left foot that's particularly significant. Um, 
But we, because Scratch lets them script things, and they do Scratch all the time, so they're really familiar with how to put ideas together in Scratch, they, they made um, a little script that moved that black square to every sort of position on the, on the stage, made a, recorded what the confidence was at each point, and then they made a visualization that changed the transparency of the square based on the difference it had on the confidence. So what they made here is a kind of a cool little visualization that shows you what parts of the image were the most significant. I really love this, um, but that idea of, and it, it gave me a chance to introduce that idea of what we mean by black box, but, but rather than just presenting it as, therefore it can't be done, it gave them a chance to play around with, well, what can we do instead? How can we try to interpret what the machine learning model is doing, what it finds significant, what it, you know, why it's making the decisions that it is? Some of the best workshops I've run have been where the machine learning model does the wrong thing where it goes wrong. I love it when lessons go wrong. Um, because it's really important for the kids to see that AI and machine learning is not perfect, and it does make mistakes, and it does give the wrong answers. But, but sometimes it's hard to... I want to make sure they get that opportunity, so sometimes I plant lessons like this, where I make sure it's going to go wrong. So with this one, we were training a machine learning model to recognize if a photo is of an apple or a tomato. And, and I thought I, I told them I was going to be helpful to them by collecting the training data for them. Now, I'm sure a lot of you can see where I'm going with this. Green apples, red tomatoes. They didn't see where I was going with this. I managed to surprise them. Um, we came to test it in Scratch. And the idea of we'd give it a new photo it hadn't seen before, and it would put it in either the apples or the tomatoes. But to test it, I gave them a load of photos of red apples and really unripe green tomatoes. And sure enough, it got loads wrong. Not all of them, but loads wrong. It put in the wrong place. Um, and it, it was interesting, because that surprised them. Um, and that once they'd sort of seen it happen, they were able to reason it out. You know? And you ask them, well, why did this happen? Well, we've taught the computer that red things are normally tomatoes and green things are normally apples. Um, so it's, it did this because that's what we taught it was true. Now, this was really heavily engineered, right? Like, I, I made this happen. What I love is when this happens accidentally, and it does from time to time in the lessons that I run. My favorite one was, was this one. Uh, we, were doing, we were making a, a virtual sheepdog, uh, basically a game where it would put the cows and the sheep in the right parts of the field. Um, so I got them to collect their own training examples, so they would do stuff like this, collect a load of photos of cows, a load of photos of sheep. Um, but the first time I ran this lesson, there was one group of kids who did something I wasn't expecting. They collected a load of cartoons of cows, like drawings of cows and drawings of sheep. And when they tested it with my photos uh, that I'd collected for them for, to use in Scratch, it got some right, but it got a lot wrong. Uh, so this is uh, testing it. So they went into Scratch, and we made this like virtual sheepdog game, and it moved the, the photos to the right part of the field. So I asked the kids, well, what did they think of that? And actually, it was interesting. They got quite defensive about it. Um, they, was, they basically said it was my fault. They said, well, you didn't tell us we were going to be t uh, getting it to sort photos, so, uh, so we didn't teach it how to do that. We, you know, it hasn't learned how to do photos because we didn't know that was what it would be needed to do. That's actually a really good description. I like that. Um, I mean, yeah, they were saying that I wasn't being fair. But I asked them, so how do we fix that? And, uh, and they were a bit split. Some of them were saying, well, if we go back, we can add some pictures of photos to our training, and then it will learn how to do both photos and cartoons. Good answer. Some of them said, we've done it right. You need to fix your test. You need to go and update your test so it does photos. I mean, that would also work. I, you've got to love the brazenness. Another example of where I did a lesson where it didn't quite do what I expected. Um, we were doing rock, paper, scissors. So I get them to hold their hand up to the webcam and make a shape of a rock or a paper or scissors, train a machine learning model to recognize hand shapes, and then they, they play a game against the computer of rock, paper, scissors. And it normally works pretty well. There's always um, some kid who holds their hand dead still and hammers the photo button and ends up with virtually identical photos. Um, their machine learning model isn't very good. There's always some who take their time and put their hand in every, you know, some really close up, some far back, uh, some with their left hand, some with their right hand, and their models work really, really well. So they stumble on this idea that diversity of training data has a really big impact. But my favorite one that happened was, there was one student I worked with who 
they had a really good set of photos. Uh, I have to use cartoons because obviously I can't show you photos of children that I work with. Um, but I've recreated it with emojis. Um, they collected a really good set of photos of, for rock, a really good set of photos for scissors. But when they were doing paper, one of their mates in the class had come over to, to chat to them and was stood next to them. And because of the way the webcam was pointed, their mate was in the frame. They were visible in all the photos. They didn't notice that. No one thought anything of that. But when they were playing the game, uh, when they were testing it in Scratch, um, every time they held up their hand, the computer would say rock or scissors, depending on their hand shape. But then when me or their teacher came over to stand next to them and see what they were doing, the machine learning model would always say paper, no matter what their hand was doing. Because their machine learning model had learned that a hand means rock or scissors, and a hand and a person means paper. And it took us, it took us quite a probably like five, 10 minutes to reason, like, why is it doing this? But when we went back to the training examples, we could see it. Um, and I love that that happened, because that was a really cool uh, lesson for the kids to learn. But this idea that computers learn from patterns in the data we give it, and it might not be the pattern that you expected or that you intended. Um, and that, that, that sort of accidental thing can happen. And it meant I could tell them fun stories. I'm sure you've heard of stories like um, the, the Stanford uh, Cancer Project, where they were training a machine learning model to recognize from photos of skin whether or not a mark on skin was a cancer or just some benign mark. Um, if you haven't heard this story, it's brilliant. Uh, if you've ever seen medical photos, they always put a ruler somewhere in the photo for scale. Um, so what they collected was a load of photos of a mark on skin and, with a ruler and a load of photos of just skin. So what did they train? A really expensive, overcomplicated ruler detector. Um, but the fact that kids recreated that accidentally in the class and it gave us a chance, and because we had to work together with the class to sort of work out what was going on and how to fix it, it was a really great lesson there. I, I wish I could make that happen on purpose. Uh, left. Let me go to, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip to the next one. This one's good. In this project, students were training a machine learning model to recognize writing of uh, what in the UK we call postcodes, or you might call zip codes, but that idea of you know, a code that represents whereabouts this letter needs to go. So they did it by um, drawing onto the on-screen canvas um, the, the start. So these are three local towns near where I live. Um, and then we made a, like a virtual postman uh, game in Scratch where they would write on an envelope and it would send the envelope to the right place uh, based on Postman Pat. I don't know if that's a cartoon character that has left the UK. You, you might have heard of it. Um, now, what I loved about this project, apart from the fact it's a really cool tech demo and it's a chance for them to learn about uh, optical character recognition and that kind of thing, is because this is based on a real world use of AI. You know, large sorting offices have automated the sorting of, of letters and, and packages through technologies like this. It got them thinking about that. It, it opened their eyes up to this idea that AI is all around us. And even when we don't realize when we're interacting with AI systems, often, often we are. Um, so I, like I said before, I love projects based on real world uses of AI because it does uh, inspire the kids. It opens up their eyes to, to how it impacts their lives. Um, I'll finish on this one. Um, this one was based purely off uh, the fact that the teacher and I liked this idea of the phrase, you can judge a book by its cover. So we wanted to see, can a computer judge a book by its cover? So we collected um, a load of, uh, the kids collected examples of front covers of books, trained a machine learning model to recognize for this one, a music book, a cookery book, and a, a kid's book. Um, and then we used this in, uh, in Scratch to make like a virtual library assistant that you would show it a book and it would predict which shelf that book should go on based on, on what it looks like. Whether or not you would actually want to sort books like that, probably not, but it was a fun one. Actually, we did this in, um, in uh, Android as well because you can do this from App Inventor, which is a nice low code way of making Android apps. So um, because where we were doing it, the, the computer lab was in the same sort of part of the school as the library. So I had them all with these AI powered apps they'd written themselves, um, running around the library, pointing their phone at books um, and sort of to sort them, which was a lot of fun. So what I wanted to share was, you know, I love that I get the chance to not only do my day job uh, with, with corporates and customers, but I get to spend a lot of time working with schools and with kids. And I'm constantly amazed at how, with a tiny bit of nudging and prompting, and just a chance to experiment and play 
with AI tech in a sandbox that they're already familiar with. They can learn so many of the lessons that, that we learn uh, working with this stuff day to day. Uh, I mean, to summarize it, you know, this is kind of like the main ones I've been talking about. This idea of what are the phases of a machine learning project? You know, predict what you think it's going to need to do. Collect your training data. Um, use that, those examples to train a model and then test that model with data that's different. Um, how do you interpret the results? This idea of, you know, what do you do about that black box challenge? How can you use confidence scores? Um, the impact of bias of unexpected patterns in your data uh, and just the way that it impacts their lives, you know, starting to realize about how, whether we're making a recommendation engine or a virtual assistant or, or any of these kind of things, it gets them thinking about how these systems, instead of that Alexa being this magic black box in the corner of their room, it's something that they start to understand because they've made one for themselves, you know, a little simplified one, but it starts to give them some insight into to what's going on. So, thank you very much for listening. I hope some of that was, was interesting or useful. Uh, my name's Dale Lane, and that was it.